and it would take 15 of these bags. So the food pantry can buy this for six cents. We can buy it for 92 cents. So if you wanted to give food to the food, tuna to the food pantry, it's better to give them cash so they can buy it themselves. Okay. This is a can of peaches. And this can of peaches is a Fairway brand, but the light version of, at Hy-Vee Online this morning is $1.26. So if you wanted to fill up a red bag of peaches, it would be about 12 and you'd probably be able to carry it, and it would cost about 15 bucks. But if you, bought, if you gave that $15 to the food pantry and they bought the can of peaches from the Food Bank of Iowa, they could buy 80, I think it is. I wrote it down, hold on. They could buy 82 cans of, two, or cans of peaches and fill up about seven bags. Okay, one last thing here. This is a can of tomato soup. It cost $1.33 at Hy-Vee Online this morning. It's on sale, by the way. You get four for, uh, four for $5. So how much do you think the food pantry can get this food, this can of soup from the Food Bank of Iowa? Any guesses? You're all good because you never nobody went over. This food, this can of uh, soup, would cost the food pantry about a dollar thirty-three to buy it because they can't get it from the food bank of Iowa. Right? So they can get peaches, but they can't get soup. So this time, as a church, when we help the food pantry, we're asking you to do a food raiser if that's what your heart tells you to do, and if that's what it is buy the things that the food pantry can't get for cheap from the food bank of Iowa. And those things are on a list on the table in the back with the red bags. But if your heart tells you that you should give funds to the food bank of Iowa, there is a red bag with a collection plate in it and a sign that says food bank donations, put some money in there. Put cash or checks, checks to, made out to uh, the Norwalk area food pantry and they will go and buy all the tuna and all the peaches and all the other things that they can get from the Food Bank of Iowa, and you will spread your, um, your money out and your ability to help those who are hungry a lot further. But don't forget, there are things that they can't get, and they still need those things donated. So depending on what you want to do, however your heart tells you, I like to fill up a bag and carry a bag in. It, looks, it makes me feel good. I'd much rather do that than hand them cash. But I also know that if I hand them cash, they can do a lot more with that cash. So maybe you do both, maybe you do one, maybe you do the other, it doesn't matter. Whatever we do helps. Um, I can tell you that, that the food pantry isn't lacking for business. Um, it's about 70, 80 families a week that they serve. Um, I, I equate it to the grass in the summertime doesn't matter how often you mow it, you got to mow it the next week, and the food pantry is the same way. doesn't matter how much food we give them, the next week they need more food, and the week after they need more food. They always need more food, and they always need more cash. So whatever you do helps. It's never enough. Yes, ma'am. So should we bring them a bag here, or can we take them to the... Nope, great question. So for the next two weeks, take the bags home with you, um, and then next week bring them back, or the week after bring them back. Um, and then collect them here, leave them in the um, fellowship hall, and then once we have them all, we'll take them down all at once. Um, that way we can coordinate with them and they'll have somebody there to put the food away when we get there. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you'll have to talk about that. Anything else? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yes, <clears throat> uh, an email went out about uh, laundry supplies and that kind of thing. One of the things that we're going to do and churches in town are going to do is regularly advertise the Wednesday Warrior Giving, and that's what the laundry supplies are about. And so we have something that they're going to be collecting information. So, uh, yes, indeed, I believe so. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. And. Uh, just as an FYI, um, starting in March, 
we're going to move to sending out kind of a newsletter around the 1st and the 15th of every month. And Beth is going to coordinate that. And so if you have things going on, information, things like the ward and other things related to community events and things our church is participating in, all that information is going to go in letters. So just forward them to her. We'll send out a Friday mailing this week to give everybody the information and life will be good. And let us know if you want more communication or less or what else you'd like to do so that we can all kind of keep informed on what's going on in the church and the opportunities that we have for being engaged in ministry in our community. All good? Okay. All right. Yes. And I just wanted to remind everyone that the UMW retreat is next Sunday, starting at 2 o'clock. Laura will be sending out an email about the event. Everyone is welcome, even if you've never been to UMW. Bring a friend, whatever. We plan to have some fun, do some little mission, and just get to know each other a little bit better. So hope to see you there. Thank you, Brenda. All right. Anything else? All right, then, friends, I invite you to stand and let's join together in our mission and vision statement. Hmm? We have gathered, gathered here to know, to know God, God personally, personally, love Jesus passionately, and to have our lives filled with purpose through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We are Norwalk United Methodist Church, and we are doing the walk. We'll open the first verse of How Great Thou Art. Will you join me in the call to worship? To you, O God, we lift up our souls. Lord our God, in you we trust. Make us to know your ways, O God, teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth, teach us. Good and upright is our God, who leads the humble and teaches them. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in singing the opening? Him, he lives, number 310.
are sounding good today. So you can go ahead and sit down and then join me in the opening prayer. Eternal light, shine into our hearts. External goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy upon us. That with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to our holy presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the Old Testament scripture reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They will be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Now, another. Okay. Okay. I don't think that one's here, is it? I'll read it up here. So now we're going to read Psalm 1. Is, is it a hymn? No. A responsive reading. Okay, sorry. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is not. They are like trees planted by streams of water, that they yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. And all that do they prosper. All right. Now we will have a special music. Oh, one more slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> the wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of righteousness. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the the wicked shall perish. Right. So now the choir.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, does, yeah. If anyone has uh, prayer requests, Brenda will come around and pick them up. So, just so you know. All right. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 6, and we start with verse 17. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of the, their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Thus ends this reading of the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for your presence with us this day. As we seek to deepen in our faith, speak to us now through your word that we might draw closer to you and more open to all the ways in which you invite us to thrive and live your life in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in my pocket here, carefully sequestered, I should have taken a picture of this and put it on a slide is a bluebird of happiness. It's a little glass bluebird. I have no idea how old it is, but it's probably at least 25 years old. Well, it's probably at least 30 years old. It belonged to my mother, one of a couple. Um, I got one and one of my sisters got the other after her death. She was um, given a couple of these by some of the nurses that she worked with when she was still working. Her floor had a thing going, it was partly a morale thing, where they would give rewards and prizes and thoughtful gifts to each other. And there were a couple of years that she won the Bluebird of Happiness Award. <laughs> and one of them was also given to her by a friend of hers that she was very close to while she was still working. And the purpose was twofold. One was to just express thankfulness for the spirit and the encouragement that the person gave to others in the workplace, on their work team. And the other was also to give them a blessing and say, I hope that when you look at this bird, you will be blessed with happiness. A really sweet thing to do. And there, my mom, she um, kind of prided herself being able to raise up new doctors and nurses. You know, the doctors would come around on the floors and do rotations while they were residents. And she took them under her wing and made friends and showed them the ropes and, you know, the ones that appreciated it. Some don't, of course, you know, but we're all different. And the same thing, too, they had nurses from the nursing school at Grandview um, University. And so, from time to time, they'd get students assigned to them to do rotations and shifts for um, several weeks or a couple months, and she loved doing that. She loved being able to encourage people and 
encourage patients, and help other folks who are on her team in that work of healing. So, bluebird of happiness. And so now, of course, when I look at it, I have happiness because I think about my mother. We'll just put you right there so I can see you. And remember where you are. Now, today we have some scriptures that talk about blessing, and they're also using the word sometimes happy. You know, perhaps you've heard sometimes the Beatitudes, especially the Beatitudes from Matthew, translated happy are those who, and then they fill in the blank, right, with the words that we know. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, or happy are those. And some of us in this room are old enough to remember the late um, Reverend Dr. Robert Schuler, who once upon a time, I think, wrote a book called The Be Happy Attitudes, hmm, right? But these scriptures really aren't about being happy, although happiness is not excluded from them, right? The word that's translated into English as happy or blessed isn't easily translated into English, although blessed comes closer. And all of these scriptures talk about blessing and curse, or blessing and woe, in ways that are pretty graphic. And so let's go on a little journey here and talk about what the Bible means intro course, because it's a big subject, <laughs> about when we talk about blessing and curse, when the scriptures do this, both the Hebrew Testament and the New Testament, what are they talking about? Because if it's not about cultivating happiness, then what is it? Hmm? Now, the psalm gives us a clue. This psalm, it's not only the first psalm, but it actually introduces and encapsulates all the psalms by the way it's constructed. It talks about people who are blessed being those who root themselves in God's life. They're like trees planted by water, which yield their fruit in season. They do not suffer when there's drought, just like Jeremiah, which is a parallel text to the psalm. We don't know which one came first. And they also say, but the other side is, if you don't do that root planting, if you don't drink from the life that God has to offer, then if, in effect what you are doing is choosing to be cursed, which is the exact opposite, as one might be. Okay? So... The whole purpose of the Psalms, the whole purpose of the law, we'll put air quotes around that and talk about that in just a minute, is to show people the path of life. What does it mean to walk in God's light and in relationship with God for all of our days? What does it mean? We kind of get caught up on the happiness thing, and even a little bit in our culture, and other cultures do this too, on the blessing thing, because when you look at what Jesus said to the crowds, and particularly to his disciples, because scripture says he looks, there are crowds around, and he's teaching and healing, but he looks at his disciples straight in the eye, so to speak, and he says, blessed are you if, and woe to you if. Now, we hear those things, as if their old hat, oh yes, we know what this is, blessing, woe, blessing, woe. Jesus' first hearers would have been shocked by what he said. Completely bowled over. Because he was talking about blessing and woe in a way that was very different from how it was commonly understood, even within the religious community. So we'll start with the blessing. The blessing, which is in the Luke text, in the Psalm text, in the Jeremiah text, is about God establishing special relationship with people. And Jesus straight up says, the blessing of God especially rests 
upon people who are poor and who are hungry. Hmm? And on people who try to follow my way and find themselves ostracized because of it. Hmm? And the woes are like curses. We say, woe is me, and we kind of joke about it. But he says straight up, those who are receiving their comfort now are going to be the ones who find themselves outside of blessing. My paraphrase, right? Wealth, a good reputation, um, having everything we need, all those things that we count with gratitude and we see as blessings, and let's just say they are, with this caveat, they do not count if other people suffer because we are blessed. It's really hard to hear that, isn't it? And that's what shocked Jesus' disciples. Everyone wants to hear God's blessing, and it's not, and, and to have it. And it's not that blessing doesn't come and we don't see with gratitude and in what sustains our lives and in the relationships we have and of all of that, right? But the caveat is there to remind us that in our societies, people always suffer. There are always people who suffer, shall I say, because of things they have no control over, and it makes them hungry, and it marginalizes them, and it keeps them in poverty. And people of faith who do not acknowledge that and find ways to be generous to their communities and to those who are in those circumstances, they are not experiencing so much wealth as and ble as blessing as wealth that is accumulated at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Jesus in this finds himself straight in line with the prophetic tradition. And in fact, we see it earlier in Luke when Mary is told she's going to have a child and she says, let it be with me as you have said. She then sings to God and she says, now God has brought down the haughty and the proud and lifted up the lowly. Those who are rich and full will now be empty, and the hungry will be fed. When Jesus goes in front of his own synagogue in Nazareth and says, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me to preach good news to the poor, to release the captives, to recovering of sight to the blind. Mm -hmm. All of those things, he says, all the things Mary sings about are in line with the promise God makes that those who suffer in this world will be lifted up and they have God's special care and attention because they're not enjoying the prosperity of others around them. And that is where our tradition comes from, our practice as a community, of always paying attention to those who are left outside. Always asking ourselves, how can we shift what we do and how we live together so that people do not go hungry, so that the powerful do not always get their way, so that the suffering that comes when some lord it over others can be mitigated. Hmm? That's the role of the faith community. That's what it's about. In this reading and in the other two readings, blessing is laid out as a relationship with God that God initiates and that people step into by trying through their days to place their trust in God and to learn, we'll talk about law here for just a moment. Law is sometimes, like we understand it, 
somebody breaks a law and there are consequences for that, right? Like crime and punishment. But more often in the scriptures, law means instruction, right? And so the psalm celebrates as being that which teaches us how to stay on God's path and walk in God's ways. So God's people in relationship with God, you and me, all of us together, our role is to offer ourselves over to God so that always we are open to whatever it is God has to teach us. Through the people that we meet, the challenges that we face, this work, the conversations that we have with our neighbors and our fellow Christians about where it is that God might be leading, all of that, we are told through these scriptures, is the path of blessing and life. Hmm? Another way it's put in the scriptures is in Deuteronomy, where there's a covenant renewal in chapter 30, and we are told this, God says to the people this, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life. The way of blessing is the way that brings abundant life. And we only discover that by trusting in God and asking God to instruct us and remain with us as we grow in faith from day to day. Now, the blessings come in different ways, right? You all can think of these things in your own experience, right? The blessing of a friendship that has sustained you in ways that you never would have expected when you first met the person. A small moment of peace in an otherwise chaotic day when you just know that God is with you or a long reflection where you think, gee, over the last few years, I can see, now that I'm reflecting on that, that God was really present to me and walking with me in ways that I didn't even recognize at the time. Sometimes the blessings are immediate, and sometimes they go long into our lives before we recognize them. Think about Abraham and Sarah. They were called in their old age to pick up their tent and go to a place that they had never been where God showed them. And they were promised that they would be a blessing to all God's people. But it was a full 25 years, a whole generation in those days, before they had their son Isaac. 25 years waiting for fulfillment of a promise. And there were days, you know, they were patient with that, and then there, there were days that they were not, and that's how Ishmael got born. Mm -hmm. But through Abraham's willingness and Sarah's willingness to continue to stay on the path, they became a blessing to the world, including to us. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the material blessings a little bit, and how we experience that in our own lives. Jesus is not saying, these folks are not saying, that wealth is terrible, right? Or that you're cursed if you have wealth. We all know, don't we, that when we're able to provide for ourselves and share with others, that there is special blessing and gratitude in all of that, right? We know that somehow we've been cared for and provided for and through our work and God's help in our work, we are sustained and given what we need and sometimes even more so that we can share our abundance with others and feel secure in our old age when we can't work anymore, right? So that sense of blessing is appropriate. It is okay because it comes out of our own reflection of how God has been present to us and worked in our lives. Where 
we sometimes forget is that that's not a given. Here's where our culture bumps up against the biblical teaching. We assume that just because somebody has benefited materially, it means God has blessed them, right? But that's not necessarily the case, right? This is the distinction Jesus is drawing. The difference is whether or not the person who's received the gift sees it as God's blessing to them as part of their journey of faith. And as you know, this is a complicated thing to talk about, but I'm laying out the broad parameters here. Life and death, blessing and curse, blessing and woe. All of these things lay out before us God's hopes and desires that all people might live in a sense of abundant relationship with the God who created them. It lays out the generosity of God of being willing to hang with us as we continue to learn throughout our lives. And the patience of God that goes along with generosity in helping us when we stumble and helping us when we're confused and giving us time in those times when we're not sure that God is present to us to help us recover that sense of presence that helps us get up in the morning and do what we know we need to do and to love others and to share our lives and to face the world. Jesus is making clear to his disciples and to those who are overhearing the conversation that following him and listening to him is about following the path to life. It is a journey that happens one step at a time. That's what Jeremiah knew. That's what the psalmist knew. That's what Luke knows, which is why he shares this with us. And all of them remind us that Blessing is what God wants to give everyone. And a quick word about cursing or woe before we depart this meditation this morning. For the most part in the scriptures, woe and and curse are not so much things God does to people. They are mostly, in most examples, What happens when people choose not to take the path to life, as in the natural consequences of the choices that they have made? If they don't walk the path of life, they're going to find themselves awash in a sea in this world where they have nothing to hold on to. That is not the path to life. It is a path, Jesus says, Deuteronomy says, Jeremiah said, to death. And so this journey that we're on is about choosing life, choosing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, letting him teach us, letting our ancestors teach us so that we can become the people God wants us to be. And in that, find the blessings. How great is our God. Amen. Let's sing.
Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for dwelling with us so that we might know your presence and know your love. We lift you to this day, um, our world, and some of the troubles that are going on. We pray for the places where there are standoffs at the borders between the US and Canada, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, other places where there is unrest. We ask, dear God, for your intervention, the interception of violence by peace. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray this day for people everywhere who are feeling the pressures and the hurt that comes from ongoing economic changes over which they have no control. Job loss, inflation, worries about the future, shifts in industries. We ask that you abide with them. Help them to know that they have a special place in your heart. And help all of us to keep them in mind as we consider how we can act in ways to make our world better for everyone. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for teachers and healthcare workers throughout our country and really throughout the world, but especially in places where angst over pandemic response is making their jobs harder. Abide with them, O oh God. Grant them your strength. Life to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for all those who are in positions of governance, either of companies or in public service. We ask that you help them in all their work to um, care for one another, to think with hope for the future, and to be given the strength and the help that they need so that in the work they do, they can produce um, policy and activity that helps us all thrive. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray, oh God, for the Super Bowl, not necessarily for a specific team, but just for the well-being and safety of the players and all the fans who will be watching and celebrating this day. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray, oh God, um, thinking of this Valentine's Day that is coming tomorrow, and of first with thanksgiving for those loved ones that are in our lives, and all the blessing that they bring to us and the gift that you have given to us through them. We pray also for those for whom this is a difficult day where loneliness or problems of mental illness are exacerbated or problems in relationships are made more painful because of the holiday. We pray for the health of families and ask your blessing upon all. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. We pray with thanksgiving for Jackson, who turns 16 today. Light to the nations, hear our prayers. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for the witnesses, both ancient and present, that help us to know of your love for us and help us to stay in relationship with you so that we do not stray far from your embrace and we can continue to experience the love and the blessing that you have and grow into it throughout our lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing. I invite you now to give yourselves and your gifts to God through your offerings. Could we have a couple of volunteers to help pass the plates, please? <laughs> 